respected sisters and brothers assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh first of all before we begin i hope you understand my accent i don't have the caribbean ting accent you know that's how you speak but i'm sure people understand the accent here you have a very good accent mashallah i would like to thank the organizers for today's program the rashadi foundation and uh, its patron Mawlana abdul salam and all the other ulama mufti abdul majid and everybody else for arranging this program for organizing this program and giving me the opportunity to come and share some words with you insha'Allah ta'ala it's my first visit to this beautiful country of Trinidad and uh, insha'Allah hopefully it will be the first and I'll come again insha'Allah it's a very good country may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a tawfiq and inspire us to say that which is beneficial for myself for you for everybody insha'Allah it's just a reminder in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ ذِكْرَ تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ remind one another this is called tazkir in Arabic which means that things sometimes we know and sometimes we might not know but it's a mutual reminder we all remind one another because reminding tanfa'ul mu'mineen it benefits the Muslims it benefits the believers the title or the topic that was given to me tips to a successful marriage it's all about marriage it's all about nikah tips to a successful marriage now tips steps tips or whatever you want to call them points or ways or manners or uh, ways of having a good prosperous successful relationship a good marriage we can talk about tips I can mention some think about some good tips some of you might hear out of experience of being married for many years may come out with some tips because of knowing how it is to live with the husband or with a wife everyone will have their own tips you read a book by an expert non-muslims have written books on this topic S steps to successful marriage there's books written by non-muslims men from mars women from venus if you've seen that book so different people will come with different tips different methods different advices different guidelines of how to have a good successful prosperous happy marriage but rather than me think about what I think are good steps or good tips rather than what you think is a good ingredient for a prosperous marriage and rather than anyone else telling us the best tip or the most effective is the one that is given to us by our Lord and our Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those advices or those tips or that actually is only one tip which is mentioned which is advised which is in the Quran and Sunnah rather than having a list of tips and list list of ingredients and uh, steps to have a successful marriage we can list them but all of those steps or different reasons or different ways of uh, acquiring a successful marriage they return to one central point there's one point one tip it's a very short it's a one word i will tell you what that word is but i want you to anticipate and everyone's heard of that word as well everyone every muslim more or less 99 point 99 percent of the muslims have come across that word have known that word and it's actually a very very important part of our deen our islam and our lives and that is a central ingredient central point and that's the basis that's the uh, main reason for having a good prosperous marriage what is that that is when we get married and some of you if you're married and some of you may not be married but and but even if you're not married you know when you have a marriage ceremony you come to the masjid the imam the imams have led and, and conducted many marriage ceremonies what does the imam do 
the Imam will have the will have nikah ceremony in this masjid, for example. The Imam will sit here. The groom will sit here. The groom's wali guardian will be here. The bride's groom, uh, the, sorry, the bride's wali and guardian will be sat. There'll be witnesses. What happens in a marriage? This is very important. You see, this is the point that you know in Islam we have a deen that Allah has given us which is very much related to understanding and, and connecting it with our brain. Actually, this is something I wanted to talk about yesterday, but I'll just mention this briefly before we go on to this, that we have to live Islam. Sadly, many of us, what's happened, that our Islam and our being Muslim has become what we call robotic, automatic. You know, we have a manual car and an automatic car. The automatic Muslim, 99% of us are automatic Muslims. We happen to be born in a Muslim family and we just grow up. We see, okay, this is how Muslims do. This is my dad. This is, okay, masjid, dressed like a Muslim. Oh, I, I wear a scarf. I wear a hijab, niqab. Ramadan comes, suhoor, iftar, food, samosa, bajia, I don't know if you eat that here, or whatever, fish, nikah, how is marriage? Oh yeah, we go to the masjid, nobody, why do I believe? Nobody's thought about that. What do I believe in? What's the meaning of la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah? What's the meaning of ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammadan abduhu rasul? What's the deeper meaning? What are my aqaid? We need to understand and and understand and reflect on these meanings daily in our life every part the non-robotic and the non-automatic the manual muslim is someone who every minute of his or her life connects the brain with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we wake up in the morning first thing our eyes open the proper muslim who's not a robotic robotic muslim the Muslim who's manual, who has a living Islam, who lives Islam, wakes up in the morning, eyes open. The robotic one, just in ghafla, in heedlessness. It's like, okay, first thing you think, oh, I need to go work today, or oh, this appointment, or oh, I need to sell the car, or oh, I need to go there, or oh, I need to go to that office. The proper Muslim doesn't do that. First, he will open his eyes. He'll sit there for a minute. My messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam has mentioned the dua. What's that dua? Close your eyes. You don't have to close your eyes. With meaning, thought, reflection, with concentration. Alhamdulillah alladhi ahyana ba'dama amatana wa ilayhi nushur. What does it mean? All, oh Allah, all thanks to you. Praise to you Allah. I just died last night. I was dead. Five minutes, think. I was dead. Oh Allah, all thanks to Allah who gave me life after giving me death. The Quran says that Allahu yatawaffa al-anfus hira mawtiha wallati lam tamut fi manamiha Allah takes away the souls for those people who die and those who don't literally die, Allah takes the ruh, the soul away when they sleep. فَيُمْسِكُ الَّتِي قَضَى عَلَيْهَا الْمَوْتِ وَيُرْسِلُ الْأُخْرَى إِلَىٰ أَجْلِ مُسَمَّى those people who Allah has decided that they will not come back to life, He keeps the soul by Him. And the remainder whom Allah decides that they will wake up again, He sends and returns the ruh, the soul back. nushur, And then a day will come when Allah won't send that soul back. We think, this was so close to death. Every night we die. Every morning we should think, Allah has given me a new day. He's given me a new chance. You know when we have a close shave to death, when somebody has an accident so close, or somebody goes through, Allah forbid, a disease like cancer. Imagine somebody has cancer and then they have treatment. So close to death, people make resolutions. When they, when they you know, in that state, when the doctors say, maybe you could die, I say, oh Allah, please, you know, if you give me cure, rest of my life, I will spend it, next 10, 15 years. This is something we need to do every morning. Oh Allah, last night I died. I was so close to death. My soul couldn't have come back. Make a firm intention. Today, oh Allah, this is a new life, new day. This is, there's lots of other things, but all of this five, seven minutes thought with the mind. The living Muslim is who thinks with the brain. Not just 
goes through the motion, as we say. We just do things as they are. Okay, we don't know. Masjid. No, we live it. Every dua with translation, with meaning. We stand up. We think, oh Allah, subhanAllah, Allah, Allah has given me legs. I'm able to walk. There's so many people who can't walk. We go to the toilet. Before going to the toilet, we read the dua. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-khubuthi wal khaba'ith. Why do we read that? What's the meaning? With the understanding. That's why it's very important to get the true spirit of Islam in our lives. We should know the meanings of these du'as. We should try to learn, take some time out to learn the meanings of the basic surahs of the Quran. We go to the toilet, we come back of the, out of the toilet. Ghufranak. Alhamdulillah. Alladhi adhaba anni al-adha wa'afani. Why do we say that? All thanks to Allah who took away all the dirt for a few minutes. Think, I was sleeping at night and I was in just my dreams and the machines of Allah were working in my stomach. All the food and all the chicken and all the fish and all the rice and all the, you know, everything we ate, bones as well and everything we ate and gobbled up without even thinking I went to sleep and snoring away. Allah's machines are working in the stomach. Power is being generated. Blood is being made. That residue, the dirt is being, you know, put to one side for release in the morning. You wake up in the morning. Alhamdulillah alladhi adhaba anil adha. Oh Allah, this old dirt residue is coming out from my stomach. If this wouldn't come out, I would die. Wa'afani. One, two, three days, if someone can't go to the washroom, to the toilet and relieve themselves, your life's at risk. Allah makes it so easy. We don't have to do anything. Ask those people. You know, some people have this illness. They have to have a bag. It's, you know, the bag where they release and, and uh, two, three times the tube, the bag, through the tube, it goes into the bag. Allah has, without any effort, go in the morning, we just, we just, we go to the toilet as though like it's normal. It was my right to go to the toilet. Every time you go to the toilet, you can build a connection with Allah. Every time you go to the washroom, this is unique ni'mah of Allah. Amazing gift. This is, if this wouldn't happen, I would, I don't know where I would be. And then when we do wudu, there's du'as, making the intention, thinking about it, walking to the masjid, every step, sins are being forgiven. So you take the step, you, when you walk to the masjid, even if you're driving, every step, you make a step, you take a step, one sin's forgiven, 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 with the brain. 24 hour, the mind has to be connected. See, Every human thinks about something. We all, you know, all the time our mind thinks about something. We think about the dunya. No problem, we can do. We're driving, unless we're talking to somebody or we're listening to somebody. But 24 hours, when, unless we're sleeping as well, when we are awake, the mind is always thinking about something. The Muslim who's alive in spirit thinks more about akhirah, about Allah. You're driving a car, you're thinking... One day I'll be before Allah, Allah will be asking me questions. I'll be by the hawl, the pool. How will Jannah be? Imagine I'll be in my mansion in the Jannah. You look at a house here, you think oh, the Jannah mansion will be even better. It's just another 10, 30, 40 years. Average is about 60. I'm going to go. It's a long life. You know, this is a short life, eternal life. How will it be? How will grave be? Just all the time, the mind is connected to Allah. Everything we do, we sit to eat. If someone goes to eat, Somebody's house to eat, the food's on the table. This is an amazing ni'mah of Allah. We say Bismillah. Why are we saying Bismillah? We thank Allah. Alhamdulillah, alladhi at'amana wa saqana wa ja'alana min al muslimin Why do we read that dua? What's the meaning? What's the deeper meaning? There's another dua as well. After Alhamdulillah, alladhi, after eating food. Adhaqani ladhatahu. Thanks to Allah who gave me the taste of food. He kept the strength in my stomach. And the residue, he took it out from my stomach. All these things. We can think about seven, eight. Once there was a sheikh, one of my teachers was mentioning that they were eating with uh, you know, lots of the, uh, the ulama. And the sheikh said to them, that, look, we are eating here. There are seven ni'mah, bounties and gifts of Allah that we can think of in one food. I'm not going to go into them because time, we don't have them. Seven. This food that Allah has given us in somebody's house, we're eating. Seven. He counted seven different ni'mas of Allah. And he said, think of every 
whilst we're eating, think of these seven ni'mah and keep on saying Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah for every ni'mah of Allah. Even illness. Some of the ulama have written books that when you're ill, you can think about six, six seven, eight, nine, ten different reasons why illness, sickness is also a ni'mah. And this actually gives people internal peace. People are depressed today. This is how we gain internal peace. Connection with Allah. Looking at the positives. Looking at the positives rather than the negatives. Looking at things in a right way around, not the wrong way around. When someone passes away, rather than saying, oh, he went away so early, and look, look, what happened, and is it only our family, and is it only me? Think, nobody, Allah didn't give me a right to spend 40 years with my father. Allah gave me 40 years. He could have gone when he was 20. He could have gone when he was 25. He could have had a very bad accident. Allah gave him 40, 50 years. I just saw him yesterday. Yeah, of course we'll be upset. But look at the positives. Every aspect of life, this is building a connection with Allah. Thinking. When we pray salah, why, why don't we sometimes have that, you know, in salah, that, that connection with Allah? is because we don't have the khushu'. Khushu can only be acquired really by knowing what we are reading. Surah Al-Fatiha, we, we stand before Allah, like we know, we think. The hadith says, أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَى فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاك Worship Allah as though you are seeing Him. If you can't let, get to that level, then at least know that Allah is watching you. So Allahu Akbar, you know, standing like thinking, okay, I am in the presence of Allah. And then we say everything we say with the focus, with the mind, with the heart. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Why we're saying Rabb? Why we're saying Alameen? Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. What's the difference between Ar-Rahman and what's the difference between Ar-Rahim? Two of the attributes of Allah. Maliki Yomiddin. Every Muslim must know the meaning of Surah Al-Fatiha. We read every day in our life many, many times. We've, we've read every you know, part of the newspaper and everything we read, read online. And we become Muslims and we spend 30, 40 years of Islam and we haven't even understood the meanings of Fatiha. It is sad. And then the basic surahs, Alam Tara, Surah Al-Fil, Surah Al-Nas, when we, all these surahs, basic meanings with concentration. When we say, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, why we're saying that? When in Ruku' think, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim. When you go into sujood, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, what are the meanings of that? When we're sitting, at tahiyyatu what does he mean? at tahiyyatu Lillahi, wa salawatu wa tayyibat. Tahiyyat belongs to Allah, a salawat belongs to Allah. Assalamu alaikum ayyuhan nabiyyu. Then the du'as, different types of du'as you can make as well in salah, which is from the Quran and Sunnah. You don't have to always just say one du'a, you can read different du'as. After salah as well, concentration, khushu'. This is, if we live a life like that, this is very important. This is what I call a living, alive, non robotic, alive Muslim who has Islam alive in his life. Whereas most of us, we go through the motions. So even marriage and nikah, and this is what I was coming to, that I told you just 10 minutes, I'll go on to that. People get married, why they're getting married? What is a nikah ceremony? What is it? I just like, okay, people do it, I go to the masjid, to the mosque, the imam saying something, what is he saying? If I don't know Arabic, then he could be speaking in Chinese, I don't know, I don't care what he's saying, what does he say? Alhamdulillah, I know. He's, oh, he sounds good, alhamdulillah, finish, end of story. I know I'm married, I accept. No, ask, ask the Imam. Imam, before you, can you tell me what's happening? What are you mumbling? Which language are you talking? What are you speaking? What is this? The Imam will say, Alhamdulillah, Nahmaduhu, wa nasta'inuhu, wa nasta'firuhu, wa nasta'hdi. Tell him to tell you the meanings. Write it down on a piece of paper. You, if you don't know Arabic, when he's reading it, you follow it. Ah, this is the meaning. This is called khutbatul haja. This is... The sermon, actually even before I started my talk, I read that. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his habit was, before any important matter, and especially marriage, he would recite this sermon and known as Khutbatul Haja. He would praise Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and then he would send blessings on himself Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allahu fala mudilla la wa may yudlil fala hadiya la. The khutbah, famous khutbah. This is sunnah. This is actually not a condition for marriage. Marriage is done valid even without this you know how long marriage takes place in Islam four seconds five seconds I told some people count it once did you give uh, the girl can say I give myself in marriage I accept you done that's it the two witnesses have to be there four people be there the girl says I give myself to you in marriage 
I have accepted my marriage. Technically, that nikah is valid. That's it. Everything else is on the side. Before that, this, what's reading, if you don't even read that nikah is done, but why? It's a sunnah. And we should do that in that way. The Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after reciting the khutbah, he recited three verses from the Quran at the time of marriage. He chose, and this is the sunnah, and this is what the imam does. The one conducting the marriage ceremony. That's why in Islam we don't need a blessings. You know, in some other faiths, you have to go to the, the, the uh, rabbi or you have to go to the priest. Can you bless us in marriage? In Islam, you don't. You can, you don't it's good to come to the masjid and have an imam who will check the rules are done. We should. But technically, there's no need to even have an imam or a sheikh. You can just have it done yourself, technically speaking. But I still advise, of course, so that you know the rules are all... The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recited three verses from the Quran, from Surah Al-Nisa, from Surah Al-Imran, and from Surah Al-Ahzab. Now there are many verses in the Quran, many ayat in which there is the mention of nikah, there is a mention of marriage, there is the mention of rights of husband or rights of wife or women or husband. Out of all these verses of the Quran, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not Recite none of these verses. The nikah is being done. The imam is reading three verses which have no mention. Nothing. Nikah is not mentioned. Marriage is no ayat. Because the sunnah is to read these three verses. Ya yuhan nasu taqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsi wahida wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathiran wa nisaa wa taqu allaha alladhi tasa'aluna bihi wal arham inna allaha kana alaykum raqeebah Ayah, verse number one. The first, first verse of Surah An-Nisa. Ya ayyuhal nasu taqu rabbakum. O people, not just O believers, O people, fear your Lord who created you from one soul and created from that soul its mate and spread from them to many men and women. And then he said again, fear Allah, alladhi tasa'aluna bihi, through whom you ask your mutual rights. Wal arhama and be fearful of Allah from breaking ties. Arham. What taqu al arhama. Remember, in Allah kan alaykum raqiba. Indeed, Allah is watching you. O groom here sitting. Allah is watching you now. He'll watch you tomorrow. He'll watch you tonight. When you're in your bedroom, when you're 550 years old, when you're 72 years old. When you're with your children, when you're with your husband, with your wife, and then the wife as well being reminded, when you're with your husband, when you're with your children, when you're at home, when you're speaking, when you're talking, when you're gesturing, Allah is watching over you. Remember, you are being watched. You are being, you're marrying. Remember, don't, don't think that you get married and you and your wife are going to be hiding in honeymoon beach. Allah is watching you there as well. It's like a sign. You are being watched. Fear Allah. Two times, fear Allah. Second verse, Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu taqullaha haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Surat Al-Imran. O oh oh believers, fear Allah as he ought to be feared. Do not die except in the state of iman. And then the last verse, Surat Al-Ahzab, Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu taqullaha. Again, O oh you who believe, fear Allah. Wa qulu qawlan sadida. Say correct appropriate words from your mouth. Meaning, Fear Allah before opening your mouth and tongue. Yuslih lakum a'malakum wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum wa man yuti'i Allah wa rasoolahu faqad faza fawzan azeema. Now, out of all these verses, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam decided to recite these three verses. What's that golden word, common word in all these verses? You know now, I said there's one word, steps to a successful marriage. I said there's only one step. Forget my steps or anyone else's steps. This, this is what I said at the beginning. The steps mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah by Islam. There's only one step. Only one step. Every issue, every problem, every marriage counseling, every issue is solved. Every marriage counselor will be out of their job. Every sheikh will be and every imam will be have free time from giving anyone advice. No marriage problems, no mother-in-law, daughter-in-law problems, no sister-in-law problems, no problems. If everyone just acted upon this one thing, which is what? 
What's mentioned in these ayat? What's mentioned, brothers? Fear of Allah. Taqwa, golden word. Ta, qaf, waw, ya. Alif maqsura. T A Q W A. Taqwa. The person of taqwa is muttaqi. The plural, muttaqun or muttaqin. Muttaqiyya for the woman. The one of taqwa is also known as taqi. Taqwa, what is taqwa? And why is it being reminded at this time? First, we need to know the definition of taqwa. What is taqwa? We say fear of Allah. You know, there are some terms in the Arabic language, it's impossible to translate them in any language. We say fear of Allah, but that doesn't really do justice. Some words we can't translate. We have to explain them. There's no one word. The Arabic language is very unique. What is taqwa? Fear of Allah is part of it, but that's not only what taqwa is. The closest definition of taqwa is as follows. Taqwa is that a man or a woman, before they say anything verbally with their mouth, before they physically do anything with their body, any action, so any statement, any action, and also, now we have, before writing anything, whether with a pen or on Facebook or on the internet or email or text messaging or WhatsApping or whatever, and before gesturing, ishara, before saying anything, before doing anything, before writing anything, before making any gestures, they think to themselves, they again use their brains. They reflect and ponder and they think and they do muraqaba, they meditate, they evaluate. And you know what? Whatever I will say or do or write or make gesture of, I will have to prove it tomorrow in the court of Allah. Allah will question me about this. I said one word to my wife. Allah will say, why did you say it? What's your proof? What's your justification? Why did you say it? How did you say it? What was the tone that you used? You raised your hands. Why did you do that? You spoke back to your husband. Why did you say that? You swore at your husband. Why did you shout? Why did you scream? Everything we do, we will be questioned. This taqwa is important in every part of our life. But especially at the time of marriage, it becomes double important. This is why at the time of nikah, everybody is being reminded, not just the brother who's sitting in front of the imam, the man, the groom who's getting married. He is being reminded. His guardian is being reminded. The sister who's going to probably listen to this marriage or she might even be you know, hearing it. She is being reminded. Her parents are being reminded. His parents are being reminded. The families are being reminded. The grandfather is being reminded. The grandmother is being reminded. The whole community is being reminded. All of you, if you want this marriage to work, if you want this marriage to be prosperous, if you want this marriage to be successful, all of you, before doing anything, before saying anything, before gesturing about anything, before writing anything, think, ponder, evaluate, and know that Allah is going to question you about this on the Day of Judgment. And then, after that, say it or do it or write it or gesture it. Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah wa anhu, one of the great imams of this ummah, when people used to come to talk to him, just generally, people used to have conversation with him. So when someone used to talk to him, he would look down for a few minutes. For a few seconds, half a minute, one hour, one minute. And then he would raise his head and talk. Somebody came and asked him that, oh Imam, why do you do that? Why do you, when people talk to you, why do you just talk back straight away? He said, I look down and I think. I meditate and I think, I evaluate whether it's better to speak or whether it's better to stay quiet. I place myself before Jannah and Jahannam. I think what I'm going to say will take me to hellfire or will it take me to paradise. And then I open my mouth very carefully. I choose the words carefully. I choose the tone carefully. We talk, Allah has given this is ni'mah, we just talk. Whatever comes out from my mouth, you know, Jarahatu sinani lahal tiyamu wa la yaltamu ma jaraha lisanu. It's a po poem in uh, poetry, line of poetry in Arabic. The wounds, we know, the wounds of the tongue, they can't be healed. And this is actually what causes problems in marriages. Men and women, when they get married, they think they can say anything however they want to say. 
uh, the other person is a human being. They're your spouse, they're your husband, they're your wife. Sometimes our sisters, you know, they just think, okay, well, we can say whatever we want. It doesn't matter who cares, you know, shout, scream, whatever. This actually, every tone, word we will say, Allah will question us. And this is the main tip of a successful marriage. How we talk, and this is why, so being reminded at the time of marriage, that this is important in every part of our lives, but especially reminder at the time of marriage because it becomes more important. Why does it become more important? Because before marriage, you were alone. You were alone. You were not alone. You were still living with your family. You were living with your parents. But you were not connected to somebody as closely as you will be when you will get married. You were at home, but you had your own bedroom. You're a sister sleeping at home. You've got your own. You might be sharing it with your sister, whatever, but you're still not. There's nothing connected. You're by yourself. And then you grow up, you have your own room. Your parents, you know, you have rights. You, you, as a man as well, you have your own place. When you get married, you're sharing a house, you're sharing a room, you're sharing, you know, bills, you're sharing f food together, you're, you're shopping together, you're eating together. Everything is now, you're no longer a bachelor. No longer someone who can just come home anytime they want and don't think about anybody or anything or sleep however you want. Before, if I was in my bed and I could snore like anything, who cares? Now, if I snore, I need to be careful. As a, as a good Muslim husband, I need to ask my wife, does my snoring disturb you? That's bad. I am not happy. I need to sort myself out. I need to try. If you, you know, please, or oh, seek forgiveness. Please, wife, forgive me. You know, I, I'm, I'm disturbing your sleep. If you don't, if you, if you want, I can go and sleep downstairs for a while. Seriously. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would wake up for Tahajjud Salah in the middle of the night, he would tiptoe slowly. So that he, when he makes wudu, when he's walking, it does not disturb the sleep of his beloved wife Aisha radiallahu anha. When we wake up for Tahajjud, if we do wake up, we'll make sure that everybody in the house knows, oh, Alhamdulillah, yes, I'm, <coughs> I'm waking up every... Look at this house, too many people sleep in this house, you know, <clears throat> tahajjud is very important. Because it's not necessary. You can advise like you wake up, but if not, then you don't disturb people. Disturbing, all these things, because now once you're married, there's someone else is connected to you. And that's why there's a hadith. There's a hadith in Sunan al-Tirmidhi where the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that uh, when a person lives with others, then naturally... Feelings will be hurt. Al Muslim Ladi Yukhalitun Nas wa Yasbir Ala Adahum Khairu min al Muslim Ladi La Yukhalitun Nas wa la Yasbir Ala Adahum. A believer who doesn't mix in with people and therefore he doesn't have to exercise sabr and patience. If someone lives alone on a top of a mountain, on one island, nobody to hurt, nobody's feelings to hurt, nobody's going to hurt your feelings, no nothing, no problem. The hadith says that that Muslim man or woman who lives with people. And therefore, he has to or she has to exercise sabr because that person's feelings will definitely be hurt. The hadith is saying that once we live with people, then it's impossible for feelings not to be hurt because everyone's different. Everyone thinks differently. A man thinks differently from another man. Here in marriage, it's not even a ma it's a man and a woman. There's a difference between man and a woman. Every human being thinks differently, talks differently, has different interests. Have dis every human being has a different opinion about what's right and what's wrong. And then if there's two different genders, then it's even big difference. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. We, make, we are completely different species. Women think about things differently. They have needs which are different to men. One of the greatest reasons of problems in marriage is this, that men and women, they forget that they have married a, a woman forgets that they have married a man and a man forgets that they married a woman. The man has lived all his life with his friends as a bachelor. He thinks that this is another mate in the marriage. This is another like I'll have shisha with again. You know, this is a, this is a, you know, just like my friend that I used to hang out with. This is not a, your friend, more than a friend, of course, but this is a woman. She is psychologically, mentally, emotionally different. A woman needs to think. This is not my friend that I used to talk to two hours and she would say, oh, really, really, you know, for two hours he, she could listen. This is a man. Man can't listen to two hours of conversation. So realize that. 
When a man wants his wife to be like him and when a woman wants his, her husband to be like her, that's the, one of the causes of marital problems. Men, women do things differently. A woman needs attention. She needs, a woman by nature is more, very sensitive. Allah has created, that's the beauty of a woman. This is actually derived from a hadith. There's a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari elsewhere where the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, المرأة خلقت من, ضل, خلقت من ضلع المرأة كالضلع In another riwayah, خلقت من ضلع وإن أعوج ما في الضلع أعلاه إن ذهبت تقيمها كسرتها وإن استمتعت استمتعت بها وفيها عوج A woman is created from a rib. The rib is bent. The most bent part of it is the upper part. If you try to straighten the rib, then it will snap. Therefore, just derive benefit as it is. Now, this hadith is not condemning or like looking down on the women as some non-Muslims have understood. There's a commentary on this hadith. You know, people need to understand the hadith properly. I have a small booklet which, I don't know if you've seen, 40 hadiths I gathered with commentary. And one of the hadiths, I talked about this, in, this hadith in detail. This hadith is telling a man, not that a woman is bent or, no, no. Is telling a man that, oh husband, man, no, realize that your wife is not, is different. For you, she may seem bent because she seems different. She's, she's not acting like a man. So she seems different. Bent here means different. And likewise, for a woman to understand that the man is different. Therefore, the man is being told that, look, oh husband, don't try to straighten her. Don't try to make her like a man. Don't try to make her like you. Don't make her, don't, don't have this, uh, Thought in your mind that I will make my wife just like me. She has to think like me. She has to like things like me. It won't happen. You've married a woman. You've not married a man. If you forget, then keep a tasbih in your hand and say, I married a woman, I married a woman, I married a woman. Just remind yourself, oh yeah, I married a woman. I'm not, I married a woman. Because some men forget. And likewise, women as well, think, my husband is a man, he's a man, he's a man, not a woman. Because people forget, a woman is by nature sensitive. You know, some sisters, they'll know this, they cry sometimes. You ask them, why are they crying? I don't really know why I'm crying. Says, I don't know, I just feel like crying. They just, why are you crying? I don't know why I'm crying. I just feel like, today I feel like crying. Now, some people smile at this. That's normal. That's normal for a woman. That's part of being a woman. If that didn't happen to a woman, that means she's not a woman. By nature, a woman is more sensitive, she's emotional, she's fragile. She needs, that's why the Quran says, Wa bil ma'roof, give her a lot of attention, love. And by nature, the husband needs to have control. A husband needs to be respected. This is why in Islam, the biggest right for the wife, this is another topic, the most important right for the wife is good treatment, love, care, attention, being sensitive towards them, giving them so much, so much like uh, care and attention, giving them lots and lots of attention. That's the main right. Everything else comes afterwards. And you know what the biggest right of the husband is? Respect. Considering the husband to be the emir of the house. This is my man. This is the head of the household. Allah made the man amir. If Allah made the wife amir, we would have said no problem. We, whatever, whoever, if Allah said the son or the daughter, whoever, Allah is a khali creator, he created a man, he created a woman. The problem today is that, and this is a perfect, men and women, the way they've been created, Allah is a khali creator, he knows best how he's created, and he knows the roles, both men and women, this is a perfect jigsaw puzzle. Men and women have been created as counterparts, not to compete with one another. They don't have to be same. There's equality in Islam, but not similarity. Men have been given rights, women have been given rights. Everyone's given their rights. But there's no similarity. There's a difference between equality and similarity. Equality means that you have your own rights, and you, you know, at the end of it, all the rights, they become equal. Like in inheritance, once I was at a university giving a lecture, and non-Muslim stood up, I said, mm, Islam is not equal towards women. I said, why? So in inheritance, the son gets two times. Yeah, the son gets twofold. And the, and the daughter gets one. I said, okay, you've only looked at one thing. There's so many other things, but I'll just give you one example. If you bring another one, then I'll give you another one. But you've said two, one to men. The Messenger was asked, who do I look after more, my father or mother? He said, Thumma. He said, Ummak. 
Then who? Ummak, your mother. Then who? Ummak, your mother. Then who? Thumma abaka, then your father. Three times mother, one time father. I said, you mentioned a match which was 2-1 to the men. I've given you another match which is 3-1 to women. What's the aggregate score? 3-2 score? to women. So it's 3-2 right now. Because they won 2-1 here, it's 3-1 here. If you bring another, give me another example where women, uh, men have been given more, I'll give you another one and we'll see at the end what the, the end result will be. Women will have definitely more rights. He couldn't bring any other example. So each individual thing might seem like what? Someone's been given more rights, but if you look at the whole of Islam, it balances itself out, 50-50%. So in Islam, there is equality, but not similarity. Similarity is wrong. Women can't say that, oh, you know, men do this, or we want to do this. No, there's different roles. Then, why, then we'll just have women walking on the streets with marching, saying, oh, it's not fair, why do we get pregnant? Men should get pregnant. It's unfair, men, giving, men should be breastfeeding now as well. There's, nothing, there's something wrong. There's, there's no equality. No, there's different roles. This is a role of a woman. This is a role for a man. So, therefore, there is, sim there is equality but not similarity. And that's why in Islam, women, what they need, what Allah knows a woman needs is love, is care, attention. What a man needs is being respected, looked up to, given the respect. Some people say, well, that he has to learn, earn respect. I say, no, no, no. There's, he doesn't have to earn respect. Yes, he must not lose respect. There's a difference between the two. As soon as you get married, Allah has given the man respect. He doesn't have to earn it like, okay, one year I'll have to earn respect. No, no. By nature, in marriage, a man has got that respect. Until the end of the ayah. So men are you know, qawamun, qiwam, the breadwinners, the care uh, takers, the, the heads of the household. And women need that love and attention. The biggest right for the man is respect. That's why men by nature have been created that they don't like to be told by the women. You know, if a man's driving and the wife will say, oh, you know, you've taken the wrong turn. Even if you know you've done wrong, you say, no, no, you don't know. I'm going the other way. There's another way. You don't know. How can you tell me? You know you're wrong anyway. But that's men. How, like you don't want to be told by your wife no problem that's why women need to understand men that you know even if you know that they're wrong sometimes use a way to correct them one of the biggest points in marriage is you need to be a you know have a lot of diplomacy in how you talk so this is the biggest right given to men respect women need to be submissive women remain women if women remained women and men played the role of being men we would have good marriages. This is a perfect match. A man and a woman is a perfect match. But today marriages end up in divorce. Why? Because the man is no longer a proper man. He's become half man, half woman. Not everybody, some. And the woman is no longer a proper woman. Sensitive, gentle, you know, emotional. Someone who needs like cries, you know, just looks up to the husband playing a womanly role. No, they're aggressive. They've become half men. When you have a half man and a half woman marrying another half man and a half woman, there's going to be a problem because it's two similar people. If you have a man marrying a woman, then alhamdulillah will work. But not a half man, half woman marrying a half man, half woman. This is why Islam says men be men, play the role of being men. Women have to be women and play the role of being a woman. A woman. And this is understanding the differences. Women are fragile, they're gentle, they need their care and attention. So going back to the taqwa issue, at all times, taqwa is being reminded. But especially at the time of marriage. Because when we live with somebody, people are different. I was saying people are different. So now your wife will say things, will do things, will make decisions about things which you will not like. You're, it's normal because you're different. You don't have the same brain. Likewise, your husband might drive in a way or your husband might do, say something about the kids your husband might do something at home which you don't like, you don't agree with. Normal. The hadith says, in this case, the only way forward is to do sabr. Give advice in a nice, gentle way, but the only way forward is sabr and patience. Because your feelings will be hurt. And innama yuwafa sabiruna ajrahum bighayri hisab. The reward for people of sabr and patience is without any limit in the akhirah. Bighayri hisabin.
That's what the Quran says. Because people will do things differently. So taqwa is being reminded at this time of marriage that you're going to get married now. When you go back home, you're going to live a life where at every point and at every junction you will need taqwa, the fear of Allah. At every point you will need the fear of Allah. How we speak, how we talk. This is why one of the ayah, the third ayah was reminded. Ya yuhalladheena amanu taqullah. O you who believe, fear Allah and say that which is correct. When I speak to my husband, I need to make sure every letter as a wife that comes out from my mouth must be appropriate. The tone must be appropriate. If I am a husband, when I talk to my wife, every letter, every word, the way of my conversing, talking, must be in light of the spirit of Sharia. There was one Sheikh from Pakistan, he was known as Dr. Abdul Hay Arif, uh, regarding him, one of my teachers was mentioning that once he said to some of his students that he said, I've been married for 55 years. And I will tell you, and I can vouch for it, that in 55 years, he was in his late 60s or 70s, early 70s. In 55 years of being married, I have never spoken to my wife in a high tone. I've never raised my voice. Imagine. This is what you call someone who's pious. Piety. This is why the hadith says when you get married, don't give, con give consideration to other things, but your ultimate, Deen. Deen is taqwa. If you have a wife or a husband who's God-fearing, who fears Allah, if you have a husband who fears Allah, if you have a wife who fears Allah, before they talk to you, before they speak to you, they fear Allah. They know that, you know, if I raise my voice over my wife's voice, Allah will question me. If I say something, Allah will question me. If I scream and shout, Allah will question me. If I nag, Allah will question me. If I swear at my husband, if I curse my husband, if I say bad things to my husband, all of this Allah will, there'll be a whole list. The angels are writing everything down and Allah will question me about every letter that comes from my mouth. This is why we should regularly, you know, every, not every week, I think every night, husband and wife should forgive each other. Who knows you're going to wake up in the morning. If you forgive, then inshallah Allah will forgive. But we have to ask forgiveness. Every night before going to sleep, you know what? Not just before going Umrah. Uh, brother, I'm going Umrah, please, you know, whatever I've said, uh, forgive me. I don't know whether, we just think uh, the only time to seek forgiveness. It's become like a custom now. It's like, normally people feel like ego. How can I, oh, bl brother, please, uh, forg forgive me. There's an ego. But Umrah time, nobody, even the most proud, arrogant person will send a text. Why? Because it's become custom, like it's normal, you do. Again, the robotic Muslim thinks people just do robotically. Every night, we should... Husband, wife should say, okay, I don't know if you'll wake up tomorrow or if I'll wake up tomorrow. Who knows? Oh, this is a death. Soul is being taken in the middle of the night. Allah may release it, may not. I forgive you, you forgive me. Every night. The only way is this taqwa in life. God consciousness. That's the closest translation. Allah consciousness. Being conscious of the fear of Allah. Being watchful by Allah. That everything we say, we do, we will be questioned about this and Allah will question us. And there will be reckoning, there will be hisab. يَوْمَ يَقُومُ النَّاسُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ The day when the whole of mankind will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before Rabbul Alameen, the Lord of the mankind. Everything we've done or we've, with our family or with anybody else, we are being watched. And this is the only, really, this is the only step to a successful marriage. Nothing else works, nothing Guaranteed, this is a tested, tried, approved. Every other method may be successful, but it's not 100%. Nothing. Because accountability of next life is so strong. You don't need any police. You don't need anyone's advice. You don't, want, you don't need anyone saying that, okay, I'm going to watch what you guys do. You fear Allah. That's why having a husband who is fearful of Allah or a wife who is fearful of Allah is conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That makes the marriage successful. And also, along with that, and I will end with this in the next just three, four minutes. Um, along with that, that taqwa, also part of that taqwa, is having someone, before getting married, a woman should look for someone, and before getting married, a man should look for, and if you're already married, then you should 
try to, uh, you know, both husband and wife should try to go to this path, which is along with taqwa, working on one's heart. So we could say this is the second thing, but it's part of taqwa. Working on the heart, such an important part of the teachings of the Quran and Sunnah. Qad aflaha man zakkaha. Such an important part. What does that mean, working on the heart? Working on the heart means what? It means that every Muslim, it's fard ayn, obligatory upon every Muslim woman and man until they die. That along with the external sins that they avoid and along with the external things like salat fard, the things that we do, there are so many sins which are connected to the heart and so many obligations which are connected to the heart we have to, until we die, we have to work on them. So you've got all these blameworthy character traits, all these diseases, all these sins, which I mentioned in the Quran. Whichever way you want to do this, you know, that's a different matter, however you do this. But every Muslim has to do it. So the Quran talks about jealousy being a disease of the heart. I once did a talk when I went through every single spiritual disease and connected it to marriage, how it has a direct impact on marriage. Every spiritual disease. The Quran says, لا تحسدوا. There's hadith, لا تحسدوا. Don't have jealousy. وكونوا عباد الله إخوانا. Hasad is the first person who, who uh, was Iblis. It's a severe, 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 major sin. If you get married and you haven't, we haven't got rid ourselves of jealousy, we haven't worked on our hearts to remove jealousy from our hearts, if a wife has jealousy, every time she sees her friend, she'll complain to her husband. Look at her. Look how her husband is treating her. Oh, look at their house. Oh, look at her husband. Was she jealous with the sister-in-law. One sister-in-law is jealous with another sister-in-law. Every time jealousy, jealousy, jealousy. Likewise, the husband, every time something happens, he's jealous. It has a direct impact. In Islam, we have to get rid of jealousy and replace it with Ithar, giving preference to others, wanting good for others, what we want for us. This is, this is the quality the Sahaba had. Likewise, love of dunya. Love of dunya is a spiritual disease. Every time, if a wife has a spiritual disease of worldly, materialistic, worldly love, Islam says earn wealth, but have love of Allah and His Messenger. Don't let wealth and materialistic things come into the heart. If, you have, if we have this spiritual disease, if a wife has this, Every time, you're not giving me any money, you're not doing this. I need every time you go, she's got 25 shoes and she wants another pair of shoes. She's got 10 handbags, she wants another handbag. Every time, every, just love of dunya, just materialistic things, just wants dunya, world, world, world. And if a husband has that spiritual disease, he'll be stingy, he'll, he won't give money properly, he won't spend. The wife will say, give me some, what do you, what do you, what's the currency here? Sorry? Okay, just say dollars, it's easy. <laughs> Give me dollars, you'll say, okay, why do you want one dollar? Okay, how much, okay, what are you going to buy? One potato, okay, you want one potato. You know, he's going to be so stingy, he's got love of dunya. He's, he's stingy, money can't come out from his pocket. Problems in marriage. Direct linked with marriage. And likewise, many other spiritual diseases, ikhlas. Ikhlas is very important. The opposite of that, the spiritual disease is ostentation, riyah, doing things for the sake of others. Islam says whatever we do, not just offering salah and prayer and fasting and talks and lectures and teaching and advising, that has to be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But even good akhlaq, and I'll end with this, this is very important. You know, in every religion, in every faith, in every community, in the whole world, everyone says good manners, akhlaq is good, isn't it? Everyone encourages, even an atheist would say, be truthful, be nice, be gentleman, be kind, be considerate, you know. So Islam says the same thing, but there's one difference between Islam and everybody else. In, when everyone else says it, be hospitable, be good-mannered, be generous, be nice. You want to do it so that you make others happy. In Islam... It's not even for the other person. The main intention, aim is ikhlas. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. Even when you're good to your wife, I am good to my wife to please Allah. She will be pleased. I want her to be pleased, but really it's because Allah. I am good to my parents. I am being nice to my parents 
because Allah has ordered me. I am good to my husband because Allah has ordered me. I want to make my Lord happy. I want the reward in the Akhirah. When I'm good to my children, I want the reward in the Akhirah. It's not even for that person. And this solves a lot of problems. I have so many people, you know, when they email or when they call, uh, you know, the wife will speak on the phone. Oh, you know what? I've done this and I've done this. I've done so much, but he doesn't do this. I said, okay, okay, you've done all this, but this is not buying selling. This is not a transaction. It's not that he feels good to me, then I'll be good to him. Or if she's good to me, if you do, you scratch my back, then I scratch your back. You know, you cook me food, then I'll speak nicely to you. This is not a transaction. Do things for the sake of Allah. Forget the other person. Of course, you need to avoid zulm and oppression. But we are not full being good to our husbands or wives so that only because they will be good to us or they are good to us. Then it's buying and selling. Marriage is not, not a transaction. It's not a transaction. We are not good to our parents so that they, they are good to us. We are not good to our children so that they will be good to us when they, in our old age. If that's the intention, then there's no reward. I was once driving a car in the back of the car. I saw a sign. Look after your children. Take care of them because they will be the ones... Choosing your nursing home, old age home when you're old. People, you know, look after your children because they will look after you. No, that's wrong intention. There's no thawab, there's no reward. You don't do that. You want, because Allah has given you this job responsibility of tarbiyah, of Islamic upbringing, giving them love, attention, bringing up good, good believers. This is the intention. So if you're a husband, then you, you do it for the sake of Allah. If you're a wife, you do it for the sake of Allah. This is what you call ikhlas and sincerity. So connection with the heart, inshallah. So I'm going to end with this. The summary is, what's the most successful tip to marriage? Fear of Allah, God consciousness, before saying anything, before writing anything, before making any gestures, and before doing anything verbally, thinking about the consequences, knowing and realizing that we will be questioned, and then taking the step. In marriage, if people do that every single day of their marriage, in the beginning it will be difficult. Then after about a few months, it will become your second nature. Someone might say, oh, how can I do that every single day? It's difficult in the beginning. But after a few months, it, it becomes our second nature. Then you don't even have to think. Think for two seconds. First day, you might have to think for ten minutes. But after a few weeks, months, it becomes your second nature. Because we change. Allah makes us change. May Allah grant us the tawfiq to change, inshallah, and give us prosperous marriages, inshallah. Jazakallah khaira. Qul qawli hada wa astaghfirullah wa sallallahu sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. Allahu, 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 Allahu.